Part three, chapter twelve of Short History of the Christian Church by John Fletcher Hurst. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter twelve The Reformation in the Netherlands. The union of the Netherlands under the Spanish crown was a firm bond with the old order of monarchical and hierarchical despotism. Charles V, King of Spain and Emperor of Germany, received the country as an inheritance from his grandmother, Maria of Burgundy. The Dutch had always been distinguished for their love of freedom, and, even as far back as the Roman period, Julius Caesar was compelled to annex Batavia to his dominions, less as a conquered than as an affiliated province. The same love of independence still prevailed through all the medieval period, and expressed itself in both civil and religious life. The Brothers of the Common Life, a society which was founded in 1384, made it their chief aim to improve the morals of the people, and looked intently upon a thorough reform. Gerhard Grote and Florentius Radewin represented the order, and the Brothers' House in Deventer was a centre for both laymen and preachers to teach and preach, and send their evangelists through the country. In the two schools of Deventer and Herzogenbusch alone, there were, at one time, as many as twelve hundred students in attendance. When the news of the Wittenberg revolt from Romanism came, the whole country was eager for cooperation. In fact, in no land was there such a complete and popular preparation for the Reformation as in the Netherlands. Luther's writings were caught up with avidity, while his hymns were sung with fervor along the Dutch dikes, in the boats, and in the cottages of the whole country. The Reformation assumed a political character. The people were prohibited from adopting Protestantism, and were slaughtered for disobedience. Charles V's measures were cruel and unremitting, a course which he continued until his abdication even among the last words spoken, in the far-off Spanish monastery of Euste, to his son Philip II, he urged no leniency to his heretical subjects. So violent was the opposition to Protestantism, that the people were driven to revolution, and the Spanish army marched thither, under the cruel Duke of Alva, to reduce the people to submission. The Edict of Worms, the cruel order against all sympathy with the Protestant cause, was made binding upon the Netherlands. The Inquisition was established, and the fires of martyrdom blazed all over the land. To be known as a Protestant was certain death. Not less than one hundred thousand people were computed to have been put to death for professing the new doctrines. After Charles V abdicated, and Philip II, his son, succeeded him, there was even greater cruelty. After 1555, not a vestige of civil or religious liberty remained in the country. The Protestant nobility formed themselves into the Beggar's League, otherwise called the Compromise, by which they made it their object to overthrow the Spanish authority and establish Protestantism and national independence. They were derisively called beggars by their oppressors. They adopted the term for their entire league, wore plain clothes made of the coarsest cloth, and carried a wooden bowl hung to a wooden chain as an emblem of their simplicity and of their readiness to be called poor for conscience's sake. The Duke of Alva, at the head of the Spanish army, succeeded in conquering the beggars. But the peace was of only short duration. The seven northern provinces united in a league the Utrecht Union, 1579, and in due time conquered the Spanish army. William of Orange stood at the head of the movement for national independence, and was succeeded, in 1584, by his son Maurice, who completed the work begun by his father. Erasmus, of Rotterdam, belongs in the front rank of reformers. He was the one cosmopolitan character of the times, and was Holland's greatest gift to the ecclesiastical scholarship of Europe. He did more than any man of the period of the Reformation to disseminate a knowledge of the New Testament. His pen touched all the lands 
which showed signs of awaking to the new life for it was he who handed over to the protestant cause the best and purest philological learning awakened by the humanists he was born in fourteen sixty seven and died in fifteen thirty six after a thorough training in the university of paris he went to oxford in fourteen ninety eight through the influence of lord mountjoy one of his pupils where he taught privately for a short time here began his attachment to sir thomas more which was only interrupted by the latter's death erasmus went to italy for further studies and took his doctor's degree in turin he stayed for a time in bologna and venice at which later place he published his first books henry the eighth invited him to england and while on his way thither he wrote his praise of folly the most satirical work of the times in this he makes folly speak her own mind and boast of her silliness the work is a picture of priestly superstition ignorance and corruption erasmus returned to the continent and dwelt a long time in basil where he enjoyed the friendship of ecolampadius and bear then prominent reformers he divided his time chiefly between basil and england all the while writing with great industry and spreading a knowledge of the new testament his chief works were his colloquies his edition of the greek testament his paraphrase on the same and his praise of folly he was a profound and versatile scholar and it was alone as such that he was important as a reformer he was always hesitant about withdrawing from rome allowed himself to come into opposition to luther and had no clear conception of that firm and strong theological basis which underlay the protestant structure he placed much faith in a compromise and had not that clear vision to see that such a course was an impossibility in a grave crisis of principle one of the most unpleasant chapters in the history of the reformation abundant as it is in beautiful lasting friendships is the unfraternal relationship between erasmus and luther there was a time of cordiality but this gave place to coldness and even to bitterness at the first erasmus held that luther's course was right only that he was too vehement but he came to differ radically from his old friend doctrinally they differed on the freedom of the will luther taking the augustinian view in almost its full force besides erasmus hesitated to break openly with rome and so the distance between them widened in the latter part of his life in fact erasmus looked upon the reformation as a calamity and broke off all communication with the reformers luther wrote the following of erasmus a proof of how unable men of genius often are to appreciate each other i have cracked many hollow nuts which i thought had been good but they fouled my mouth and filled it with dust erasmus and karlstadt are hollow nuts erasmus is a mere mamus making his mows and mocks at everything and everybody at papist and protestant but all the while using such shuffling and double meaning terms that no one can lay hold of him to any effectual purpose his chief doctrine is hang the cloak according to the wind he only looked to himself to have good and easy days and so died like an epicurean without any one comfort of god i hold erasmus of rotterdam to be christ's most bitter enemy i leave this as my will and testament this was harsh language unjust towards erasmus and not at all in harmony with luther's generous nature but it was called out by the dutchman's profound estrangement from the new reforms erasmus's great services to the reformation consisted in his breaking the spell of priestly influence by the bitterness of his satires and in the increased bible study which resulted from the publication 1516 of his fine edition of the greek testament End of chapter 12